Welcome to Watch and Learn. Today we're going to help you learn how to deal with some of those wonky or imperfect quilt tops. I'm Christina Whitney, a studio educator here at Handy Quilter, and with me we have... I'm Denise Dowdrick. I'm also one of the studio educators here at Handy Quilter. So Denise, you've got some great quilts here. I have some very interesting quilts here today, Christina. <laughs> they're super fun. They are a lot of fun. They're not perfect, right? They're not perfect, and there's some challenges going on. Let's be honest. It's, okay. it's challenging when we deal with imperfect quilts. So um, fun, lots of fun fabrics, and a little backstory on the quilts I have here today. The one behind me and then the one here in front of us today that we're working on, they're both made by a charity called One Common Thread. And these quilts are made by women in Honduras who are looking for work to help better their families. So they work with donated materials that they have a little like Sizzix hexagon cutter. They take these little blocks and pieces of fabric, they cut them out into hexagons, and then they um, piece them together. They just whip stitch. So there's no foundation or anything in there that's being um, to pull back out later, they just whip stitch. And I'm going to flip this over so you can kind of see what the back side looks like. And again, it's donated fabrics, donated threads. They work with whatever they have. So yeah, I'm noticing this fabric here, this nice corduroy. It's a corduroy and it's like, oh boy, that, that must have been challenging to actually try to get that to fold over into submission, <laughs> but, but they made it work. Um, so sometimes some of their patterns are, are more intricate than others and I know I went to their website and I actually purchased both of these quilt tops and um, I work with a lot of different charities. This just happens to be one that, that I found their mission really close to my heart. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what they're dealing with is not always ideal for working with pieced quilts. So we end up with challenged edges like this and I don't know about you, Christina, I don't want to have to put a binding on that edge. A um, little no. bit tricky. So I came up with a simple way to deal with that so I would not have to worry about trying to bind that. And so you'll see here on this quilt, um, with all of these imperfect edges, I wanted a way to manage them so I could get a binding on later. So what I did is I actually cut some strips of fabric out of the backing and I just cut them about five inches wide. I, I didn't really worry about perfection. I just worried about trying to get a straight edge on the quilt. So I used my channel locks and you can use electromagnetic channel locks, channel locks with impro stitcher or the channel lock clip just to make sure I'm getting this nice and straight because I need to manage some of the wonkiness going on in this quilt. So um, vertically got these um, side strips straightened out and I just made sure there's some overlap so the quilt top overlaps that. Okay, couple questions on that process. Um, did you put those strips down before you put the quilt top on at all or did you do it like throat space at a time? That's a great question, Christina. So I actually put these strips down a throat space at a time. Okay. I had really, really long strips just coming off the sides. And then when I got to the bottom, I just kind of um, eyeballed where I was going to put my horizontal strip. And then I finished off the vertical strip just by folding it over. And I actually left a side undone so I can show you the technique that I used. So I'm going to fold that quilt back this strip was quite a bit longer. I just basted my horizontal strip down first. I brought the vertical strip over, eyeballed that and just cut along the edge here. Now I'm going to just finger press. And again, I'm not worried about this perfect being perfect, but I am trying to keep it straight. So I just went ahead and folded it over like that. And then now I'm going to bring my machine over and I am going to stitch that down. And I'm using my glide foot here because I don't want to catch um, any of the, um, I don't want to flip it. I just want to barely catch along the edge. So I'm going to go ahead and I always bring my needle um, or my bobbin thread up by doing a needle up down. Okay. So I'm going to just go ahead and take care of that bobbin thread. I've brought that up. 
And then I'm going to use my tie-off feature because I have it, so why not? So I'm going to now just gently stitch that along. Now I can use channel locks if I want to make it perfect. And I have my Pro Stitcher here, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on my horizontal channel lock and use that to help guide me right along the edge. And I'm just trying to get as close to the edge as I can. Now talk to us about your thread color. So right now I am using a lime green thread because I want you to see what I'm doing. But when I did this throat space by throat space, I actually used a gray thread. And I used that gray because it's going to blend into everything I'm doing. And I can pick out the basting stitches later, but I'm, I don't want to really see any of the other threads that are left in there. I am planning on doing an edge to edge quilting motif on this. And so my plan is to leave this lime green thread on for that. And then I'm going to just choose a fun design, my, my nice neutral lime green thread. And then my quilting thread, my quilting is gonna have um, a starring role in this quilt. Cause it's just so busy. There's so much going on that I think it's, I can get away with whatever I want. But my goal, my main goal was to make sure that first I've got all of these edges stitched down and dealt with. So now I still have Pro Stitcher on this machine, but for this, I could do a couple different ways. I could use the mark feature within Pro Stitcher and just mark all of these points with my glide foot on, that would stitch it down uh, beautifully. I happen to do free motion on this. I found it fun. I still had the glide foot on. And what I did is I actually came in I turned my gears off on Pro Stitcher, and then I came in and I stitched this down. And again, I used that gray thread, and I just stitched around the edge. And by doing that and holding that down all the way across, I can now go back and do my edge-to-edge -edge quilting, and my glide foot's going to go right over those lumps and bumps and imperfections. Um, you might have noticed on this too, Christina, I took a minute and I did some basting throughout the body of the quilt just to kind of help things stay squared up because I took the time to square the strips that I put on the sides. I tried to keep the center of the quilt somewhat square just to kind of manage it. It's not perfect, but I think it's overall a very charming effect and I'm, I'm really excited to quilt this. I really love your idea here with this extra border um, and especially how you kept it square as you were loading it so that that kind of gives you a boundary for the wonky quilt so it's not shifting one way or the other even though the lines might be straight horizontal you're keeping it straight vertically as well that's I think just that's right genius. yeah that's just right Christine and you'll notice by doing those strips and not having it under the whole quilt I reduced bulk further because we have a lot of extra fabric in here mm -hmm. already but also I don't have any waste in my fabric there. My, my fabric stash is precious to me. I didn't feel the need to hold, use a whole nother piece of fabric. This is literally the same fabric that's on the backing and I just cut some strips, extra strips off as I was preparing the backing fabric. So fantastic. minimal investment, but it's gonna save me so much time when I go to put that binding on and it's also helping me kind of square up this quilt and, and keep it a little bit straighter. So here's a question for you. As you're getting ready to stitch down this remainder section, are you gonna do a basting stitch across to make sure that that bottom section is staying? I square? sure am, I sure am. So as I stitched, when I eyeballed this strip and I laid it out, I was actually visually kind of marking this point where my last two rows connect. Okay. across here and that's kind of where I placed the strip and then I used my horizontal channel lock to really just kind of help lock, lock that line in. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to again watch that line make sure that it's pretty straight along there smooth out the edges here 
and I am going to put another row of basting in right there. And I want to do that before I stitch this bottom edge down because that's going to kind of hold everything in place and help me manage this. Because let's face it, this corduroy <laughs> at the edge, it's misbehaving. So yeah. that's gonna kind of help me keep that um, mm -hmm. into submission a little bit and uh, make my job a little bit easier. Perfect, why don't you go ahead and show our viewers sure. how you're gonna do that basting. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I'm gonna re-engage the gears on my Pro Stitcher and I am going to change to a basting stitch. And again, if you don't have Pro Stitcher, you can use electromagnetic channel locks or the channel lock clips that you put on the wheels. Absolutely, and if you don't have a basting stitch on your machine, just put it to its smallest stitch. I just want something that I can pick out easily mm -hmm. later. Yeah, it's so like four stitches per inch. That's the same as your quarter inch basting Absolutely. stitch. Absolutely. So right here, I've got these two um, pieces intersecting. I don't want to stitch over that. That could be a little tricky to unpick later and I don't want to accidentally pull any of those hand stitches out. So I'm going to go just above that and I'm going to bring up my bobbin thread. I'm just gonna take that stitch, bring up my bobbin and hold that off to the side as I'm getting getting going here. And oh, we're gonna put my channel lock on and I'm going to move that horizontally and just gently manage the fabric. I'm not tugging or pulling. I'm just being really, really gentle. But I love that you're using your hand to manipulate that fabric to get it where it needs to be. That's really important. If I just, um, if I don't get my hand in there and kind of manage the fabric a little bit, it might not end up where I want it to be. The, the fabric underneath, all that bulk is so, so thick that it's really, um, it's really causing some movement in the fabric. And then right here at the end, I'm going to go ahead and switch to a vertical channel lock and I'm gonna go up the side. And again, I'm just trying to avoid any heavy intersections. And I'm just walking my finger along to kind of pull some of that bulk out. And I had already done the edges right up to that point, so I'm going to stop my basting right there. And I'm going to turn off my channel lock and just bring up my bobbin thread now. I didn't worry about putting a knot in there because I don't want to have to deal with undoing a knot later. I'm just going to trim that off. It's just temporarily holding things in place. So, okay. and with that beautiful lime green thread, boy, am I really gonna see that. That's gonna be nice and easy to pull out later. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, do you want to show us how you're gonna do the edges I sure now? can. If you wanna see some of that, I'm gonna just trim that off out of the way too. And now I'm going to go ahead and just start stitching here. So, I can use mark or I can use, um, just free motion, and I did the rest of it in free motion and found it really enjoyable. So I'm gonna turn my, my uh, gears off on Pro Stitcher, so I'm just in free motion mode. I turned my basting stitch off, and I'm at, I'm at 12 stitches per inch here. I want a really tight stitch here because I really wanna hold that down. And I'm going to, of course, start by bringing up my bobbin. You could also use a ruler here. I could that use a ruler. That I really could. And you know, the main reason I decided to not use a ruler is because my glide foot was on already. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and of course the glide foot doesn't mix well with rulers, but I could have put my sure foot on and mm -hmm. I could have used a ruler. But since my glide foot was on, I just decided to just jump in and do some free motion. And I am just gonna stay really close to the edge here. And again, I am not worried if I wobble a little, it's okay. If I wanted it to be perfect, then using mark or using a ruler would have been a better option um, because it can be a little challenging to move diagonally in free motion. And Denise is using safety here, making sure she doesn't stitch her fingers. No, I've got my fingers well out of the way, and, and actually the glide foot even helps me keep my fingers out of the way. So I'm just going really slow. Now right here I have a little spot here that I'm just gonna kinda tuck that under and go at it again. Now when I stop to manipulate fabric, Christina, did you notice that I turned the machine off? Mm -hmm. I wanna make sure the machine, the needle isn't moving while I'm doing that because I, I value my fingers and I would like to keep 
all of them. <laughs> I also like that you have the settings so that the needle stops in the down position, so it holds yes. that spot there. So for you. I, I am using cruise, but I'm using cruise at a low speed of 100, and my needle is stopping in the down position to help me hold my position when I need to. And again, I'm just going to come across here, and I'm just stopping and checking the position of that fabric again. And you could also use like a stiletto or something to help hold that fabric down. I really down. could. I really could. Um, there's so many different ways to do it. So there's no wrong way. Whatever works best for mm -hmm. you is the right way to do it. So, and I'm just going to carefully go along the whole edge this way. And then when I'm all done with this, I can actually go ahead and cut off my bobbin thread, move all the way to the top of the quilt, and I'm ready to just do edge to edge on this, which I think is wonderful because I'm gonna quilt right off the edge here. And when I take this quilt off, I'm just going to um, trim it down so my side strips are all about the same width, probably going for two and a half to three inches. And I have lots of this blue fabric left over, so I'm going to use that for my binding too. I don't really want anything distracting from the cute, fun fabrics in the center and the fun technique here. So I thought that blue was just a nice neutral base for it all. Yes. So question, you were talking about going back and doing an edge to edge. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that you've done the basting throughout the center of the quilt. That's right. When, you, when do you take out the basting? So I am going to take out the basting as I encounter it. So I am going to roll back up the front of, to the top of the quilt, set up my edge to edge design, and then I am going to quilt that first pass. In that first pass, I don't really have any bind, I don't have any basting because the border is stitched down underneath and that's kind of holding the quilt sandwich together, that and the stitches along the edge. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that first pass of edge to edge quilting. And then as I advance, I'm going to start encountering those basting rows. I've got them probably about every eight inches throughout the quilt. Okay. I'm just simply gonna take it out at that point and then go ahead and do my edge to edge quilting in that row. Let's stitch a couple more of those. Sure, isn't this fun? I found this to be really, really just relaxing and decided that the quilt behind me on the wall is another one of the same same techniques and I'm going to do that the same way too. So and I'm just so I'm actually working on an English paper piecing project with these little hexagons and trying to figure out what I'm going to do with it once I get them all together and so I'm really enjoying this technique of yours. Isn't that fun? With you the, could the faux bind or faux yeah, border. Yeah, it, it is a faux border essentially, and you could put a few pins in this if you want to, but I don't want to stitch over pins, and I don't want to be bothered with taking them out. So, to me, this works. This works great. And here, this is just a little thick at this edge here, so we're just going to manipulate that down a little bit. So. Because you can kind of see the thickness, the fullness in this fabric, can you imagine trying to base this all down, do all my edge to edge quilting, trying to keep that all flat, and then to go back and try to do a binding on that? Oh, thank you. No, no thank you for me either. That would not be fun. So, but this is fun. I'm yeah. really finding this enjoyable, relaxing, and, and what a great way to do honor to this really fun little charity quilt. Um, I really admire empowering women and finding ways to to support them. So this is just just a a fun way to uh, encourage keeping those charity quilts coming because I know there's lots of charities out there that make all different types of quilts and and I want to quilt them all because they're just fun. I like challenges. I like doing something different. So this is just just one of many ways I've come up with to deal with kind of interesting border techniques and uh, a lot of interesting fabric choices. Yeah, and every quilt that you do, if you're learning something new, that's perfect. Yeah, I think so too. I think, and it's it's just, how could you not be happy looking at something like this? It's just so cheerful. <laughs> yeah. So those were some great ideas. I am so excited to try this out on my quilt project. I can't wait to see it. Now on your hexagon, are you are you um, stitching by hand or are you stitching by machine? By hand. Okay, so that's one of those challenges that we experienced here. If I had cut the edge of this fabric off and it was hand pieced underneath, do you think those stitches are all gonna hold? 
probably not no. like they would if it was machine pieced. So, so I do look at the, not just the character of the quilt, but the construction of the quilt too. Mm -hmm. And if it's hand pieced, I want to be extra careful going in there and making sure that I'm not affecting the integrity of how that's going to hold together. Well, thank you for helping us learn how to manage some Absolutely. of these wonky quilts. All right. And I'm excited for our viewers to get to try this technique as well. So thank you for joining us today. Make sure you like and subscribe, and we'll see you next week. Have fun quilting.